This channel is part of the History Hits Network. Five years after the earthquakes, Heritage Rescue creates a pop-up museum showcasing amazing finds from the devastation. This was under the kitchen floor. So it was a complete potty. I'm not sure <laughs> if I want to read that or not. Some artefacts have strange stories to tell. They were stabbed. The challenge? To get children excited about their past. Is it gross? Oh, yeah! New Zealand has more than 600 museums and heritage sites. From large, impressive institutions to small, humble, out-of-the-way places, manned by volunteers and fighting for survival. I'm Bridget Gallagher, and I'm a heritage expert with over 20 years' experience in museums and archaeology. Every week, my Heritage Rescue team will tackle one site in need of help. We'll spend five days getting them organised and creating new exhibits. And we'll discover fascinating stories about their artefacts. <laughs> we'll engage with the local community and bring in experts to show how precious objects could be displayed and cared for. <laughs> and then we'll bring in the public to see all the work we've done. Christchurch is New Zealand's oldest city. With its Gothic architecture and the River Avon running through the centre, it became known as the most English city south of the equator. But when major earthquakes struck in September 2010 and February the following year, many buildings were damaged beyond repair, particularly in the heart of the city. It's hard to believe it now, but I'm next to one of New Zealand's most iconic and well-recognised heritage buildings, Christchurch Cathedral. The cathedral's future is still uncertain, but since the quakes, over 1,200 buildings have been demolished in the central city. More than a quarter of them were built before 1900. The reason we've come is to shine a spotlight on the work of archaeologists and the thousands of artefacts that have been discovered here since the earthquakes. Hey, Catherine. Hi, Bridget. Good to see you. Lovely to see you as well. You too. Come on in. Thank you. Catherine runs Underground Overground, a local company that has spearheaded much of the archaeology in Christchurch. Lydia is carrying out research, looking at whether or not we might need to go and actually do archaeological work on certain sites. So this hasn't happened yet? No, that's right. This is the kind of the first stage of the process where we kind of see whether we need to go and have a look. Most of the team here are poring over the results of excavations. Cursors looking at photos of profiles taken under an old theatre. So what is that telling you about um, life before the theatre? Uh, well, it tells us that there was something there before the theatre, which we didn't really know prior to doing the work. We thought it was an empty section. I suppose okay. it was, but there happened to be a circus on it and people were dumping rubbish there, and you can see more of that layer in the photo mm. she's just brought up. Hey, Cursor, is it always this kind of messy when you're onto sites like this? Yeah, pretty much. This site. Uh, the excavation went over um, the course of about two and a half years. Wow. Some excavations take a long time because the archaeologists have to fit around the building work happening on the site. So if that's what sites generally look like when you got to them, what happened when you actually found features? That's when we start to map and record them and you can see here on Hamish's screen that he's got a site plan that, we've, that he's drawn. What am I looking at, Hamish? Several 19th century town sections here. And this is the site of the Justice Precincts. This is all the different features that we found. This big one here um, is a big uh, natural gully feature which we found cutting through most of the city block. Uh, in places it was up to three and a half metres deep uh, and filled with lots of rubbish. Wow, cool. Yeah. And what was in the rubbish? All sorts of rubbish. Shoes, lots of uh, pottery. We also found lots of industrial related materials. Jesse's investigating the provenance of some of the 4,000 objects dug up at the old theatre site. Leather shoes. Yeah, lots of leather shoes. They're great. I just love the way you can see all the rivet holes yeah. in them. These ones are with the wooden pegs as well, which is quite an early technique, which is pretty fantastic. Is it? What, well, how do you know that? What's, um, what is it about? If I zoom in, you can see the, the diamond shape from the pegs because they're little square wooden holes that go around the edge of the sole. If you've got nails, you've got round holes. If you've got stitching, you've got oval holes kind of uh, fun figuring out the construction techniques. Not many of the artefacts discovered since the quakes have been researched to this extent, but every item has been recorded and catalogued. 
But in the meantime, while you've done all this, you've got the final report together, what happens to all of the rest of the artefacts? The ones that we haven't analysed or the ones that we have? All of it. <laughs> they get boxed up and held like in the storage. <laughs> there are thousands. <laughs> history Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans, with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Whether you're looking to dive into life and crime in Victorian London or the forgotten history that deserves to be heard, History Hit has a documentary for you, just a click away. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and absolute history fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. More than 100,000 in fact. Downstairs is a holding area for just some of the boxes of artefacts that will go into storage. I can literally smell the history in this room, Catherine. My fingers are itching. Well, there's all sorts of goodies. But what I'm getting a sense of is there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it, and this is only probably a quarter of it. We've got three more storage units, all of which are chock-a-block. Before the earthquakes, Catherine's company did mostly small-scale excavations. Then it all suddenly changed. It was pretty crazy. I just remember spending all day on my phone trying to find an archaeologist to go to this site, then to this site, and at the same time explaining to contractors what the authority process was and why they had to wait for us and why they could not demolish that building until we got there and just being exhausted. Now they're exhausted by the sheer volume of material they've found. But not all artefacts are kept. Some may be discarded because they're of low archaeological value. The other options are that we keep it, possibly for display or education, interpretation, further research, or it could go back to the landowner, or it could go to a museum or a university for permanent long-term storage. Catherine has two finds she wants to show me. These were found in a house that, we demo oh, that was demolished, a pre-1900 house, actually owned by a doctor. Ah. And you can see we've got a vocal preceptor. My goodness, what is a vocal preceptor? Well, I'm guessing pocket guide to the art of singing. Just the sort of thing you'd carry around in your pocket for social entertaining. Absolutely. Right. And also this. Three Fan years in a man trap. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to read that or not. Yeah, I, I don't know either. I'm not really sure what it's all about. Oh, it says here the Scottish Temperance League. So... Yeah. Yeah, so presumably tied up with not drinking, but um, we, we really don't know too much more about it than that, to be honest. But... Well, it'd be really interesting to know a bit more about these books, really. Yes. Let's see if we can flesh out that history around them. Yeah, that'd be great. That will be a project for our research to follow up once we get work underway. So we're here in Christchurch, hoping to deliver something fantastic that will help you guys. What would be on your wish list? Well, really, it's more about getting that message about archaeology in Christchurch out to the public and showing people that archaeology happens here, that it's relevant, that it's exciting, and that it's important because it's ours. Catherine's team run a blog and a Facebook page and do talks to publicise their work, but they're struggling to reach a younger audience. It would be great to see kids getting more involved in archaeology and learning more about those processes and, I guess, thinking about how archaeology is relevant to them and to the world they live in. So if we could do something along those lines, that'd be fantastic. Getting kids into archaeology and history is on every museum's wish list, and it's very hard to achieve. However, with this not being a museum, we have the freedom to experiment. That's next. Heritage Rescue is in Christchurch, helping to create an exhibit for artefacts recovered from the aftermath of the earthquakes. Shipping containers have become a common sight here. Cheap, strong and easily moved, they were ideally suited for use as temporary shops and cafes. So we're borrowing the idea for our display. The location is the Commons, a demolished building site that's been turned into a public space where musicians perform on the weekends, stalls sell food and families come to play. Right, so we've got one empty container and one pallet 
but what else is going to happen in here? We're going to be using the pallets to fill the container with to create little hidey holes for our artefacts to sit in. You're going to put pallets all the way across here to what to represent walls of buildings? Yes, absolutely, because as you know, a lot of artefacts were hidden inside the walls, like letters and shoes and all sorts of fun things. Continuing with the pallet theme, in the centre, two pallets will be raised off the floor to form an elevated sand pit. We're going to be installing a dig pit where the kids can really get hands-on and get real tactile with it. And at the other end of the container, there will be another interactive exhibit to get children excited by archaeology. But I'm going to have to wait to see what it is. Justine, I've got a great assignment for you. Catherine has given us two paper documents that they've found during excavations. This is the first. Pocket Guide to the Artist Singing. The music book. It is. And this one. Three Years in a Man Trap by T.S. Arthur. All about the temperance movement. Oh, fantastic. Underground Overground have got all the information about where these came from, they have the physical evidence, but what we really need you to do is to find out about the social times in which these were being used and get a much better sense of the history of this place. Oh, that sounds like good fun. It does, doesn't it? And I look forward to hearing your voice <laughs> when you sing me this song. <laughs> You'll be lucky. <laughs> With the team hard at work, I'm off to find stories behind the artefacts and collect information for the new exhibit. First, I'd like to know how the city of Christchurch started. The earliest description of the city site and the surrounding Canterbury Plains comes from Barney Rhodes, the captain of a whaling ship which moored in Littleton Harbour in 1836. He climbed the 500 metre high port hills to see what lay on the other side. And he climbed up to the top to have a look and he said, it was this vast, flat plain covered in water. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I'm quite pleased that historian Jeff Rice and I don't have to make the same climb to get to the captain's vantage point. It's very flat, isn't it? <laughs> it is incredibly flat. Yeah. How on earth did those Englishmen decide where to put the town? That decision was made by another captain, Captain Thomas, the surveyor entrusted with the design of Christchurch. People will criticise Captain Thomas for putting a town in the middle of a swamp, but uh, he chose the largest area of dry grassland down there. And, and the swamps didn't put them off. They were Victorian engineers, after all. You know, they, like the Romans, they saw a swamp and said, ah, we can drain that, you know, we can make that useful farmland. Captain Thomas and his engineers designed and built the town on a grid pattern, as was fashionable in the 1800s. The new American towns were laid out in the Midwest on grid patterns with a square in the middle, but normally they have a courthouse in the middle of the square, but this being a Church of England settlement, they had a cathedral in the middle of the square, in the middle of the town. And the idea was to transplant a slice of England cut from top to bottom out to a new land. Right. And so you had your gentry and your landowners at the top, they were the colonists who'd, who'd paid money for their land, and the steerage passengers were the migrants, the workers. However, the dream of a New England was slow to materialise. The Port Hills, which separated the port of Littleton from Christchurch, were a physical barrier that made the movement of people and goods very difficult. The economy of Christchurch really stagnated in the 1850s. It was a pretty rough frontier colonial town, really. But that all changed in 1867, when five years' work saw the opening of a two and a half kilometre long rail tunnel under the Port Hills. It was the first railway tunnel anywhere in the world through the rim of an extinct volcano. But once it was done, of course, then Canterbury could export its goods to the world. And the 18, later 1860s and 1870s were very prosperous in Canterbury. And the transition from the early wooden Christchurch of, you know, shacks of little houses and cottages and things, by the 1870s they were building substantial two- and three-storied commercial buildings in brick and stone. And the, the inner part of central Christchurch was getting to look like any other Victorian city in the world. With more money and more people coming and going in the mid-1800s, how were Māori affected? Te Māori To is an expert on the history of Naitahu, the local iwi. Christchurch was really a swamp, yep. so it wasn't the centre point. The centre point 
was Kaiapoi Pa, just north of here. And this spot here was really the Avon, which was dotted with a whole bunch of campsites along it. This was one of the main places where Māori traded with local settlers. Fish and vegetables, flax to make rope, and timber for all the building happening in Christchurch. The interesting thing about the Ngaitahu economy is it's booming right through to the mid-1860s. But come the end of the 1860s, the settlers were more established. The tunnel had gone in, and there was a steady supply of goods coming from the port. It was then that the local council started to move Māori off land that had been set aside for them. So our people were actually stopped from living on the reserves in the 1860s, and they had to move into Christchurch here. Ah, and what was the reason for that, do you think? The rural community wanted Māori land, right. because all the other land had gone. So Māori ended up with the less desirable, less productive land around the city and on the Canterbury Plains. We were marginalised. Yeah. And you can see it in the design of the city, the Anglican church in the centre, mm. Catholics on the margin, Māori right on the margins. Right. That explains why almost all of the artefacts recovered in the post-quake excavations are European in origin. The central city area had been taken over to accommodate business and housing for the new settlers. We'd have two, vertical, you know, like longer ones on either side. Most of the artefacts going into the display we're creating date from the late 1860s onwards, when the city started to boom. The archaeological excavations have unearthed some fascinating stories of business in early colonial Christchurch. This is the residential red zone, and these houses were all demolished after the earthquake due to the land damage underneath them. And then Catherine's team came in, started digging, and made a discovery. The man called Charles Henry Cox yep. lived here with his family in the early 1880s. We found during the excavation lots of blacking bottles like these, which are used for shoe polish, and lots of these bottles, which are Hathaway's Peerless Gloss, also used for shoe polish. OK. Firstly, we thought, well, maybe he's a cobbler, you know, selling lots of this to his clients, something like that. But we couldn't find any evidence of him having been a cobbler. But what we did find was that Mr Cox was, in fact, selling his own personally branded uh, blacking polish that was guaranteed to make your shoes last forever. But what the archaeology showed was that, in fact, he was buying lots of Hathaway's Peerless Gloss decanting it into regular, non-branded blacking bottles and selling that. Fascinating. So what, he imported this from somewhere? Yes. Doesn't that make him a smart businessman? Well, I suppose. And it, I mean, and I think one of the things that shows me is that lots of the stories we find here in Christchurch are about entrepreneurs. They're about people who came here and made new lives from these new opportunities they had. And he was one of those people. At the pop-up exhibit in Christchurch, the main pallet shelving is almost complete. And now Marie and the team can get on with the painting. The bottom bit, we're using this colour, and then we're going to put a crackle onto it. To make it more appealing to children, Marie's chosen strong, vivid colours. Either the gold needs to come down or the red comes up. While that's going on, I'm chasing more stories about artefacts recovered since the quakes. Driving through the city centre reminds me of going through a, a city that's been ravaged by a war. There's blank spaces where obviously buildings have been and now cleared away. Wherever there's a new building going up, you can be pretty sure that the ground underneath was investigated by archaeologists. That's supposed to be all finished. Hamish was involved in the excavation of this large central city block uncovering artefacts from a late 1800s metal foundry and sawmill, and also evidence of people's homes predating those structures. We found posts and post holes. So like timber frame buildings there? Yeah, that's right. They also discovered lots of old rubbish pits in the backyards of those properties. Most people just dumped their rubbish in their backyard, okay. dug a hole and buried it. The artefacts found in those rubbish pits gave an insight into the way people lived back then. Similar patterned mugs and plates in different locations reflect the small consumer market of the new colony. And the number of clay pipes and the variety of shapes show how common tobacco smoking was. And then there were the finds they made in another kind of pit. Some pits, we're pretty sure, weren't dug specifically for the purpose of rubbish disposal. Oh, yeah? What, what kind of disposal was it? Disposal of poo. <laughs> there were pits dug for poo. <laughs> 
Outhouses, or long drops as they're commonly known, were in use for the first 60 years of Christchurch's history. And they've proven to be a rich source of artefacts. The human waste coats the objects and helps to preserve them. We've certainly found a lot of really well-preserved wooden and uh, textile, leather artefacts. But there was also an unusual find at the bottom of one long drop, a chamber pot. So it was a complete potty, small size one, so a children's potty. How did it end up in there in a complete state? <laughs> Whether it was dropped yeah. deliberately or accidentally, we will never know. Do you think we could get that potty and, and actually use it as part of the display? Oh, absolutely. Possibly a bit lower. Back at the Commons, the team have already started constructing the exhibit with the potty. Children love toilet humour, so they'll get this even if their parents won't. So just uh, go, go down, 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 stop. It's going to be there. While our focus is to make an exhibit that will get modern children interested in Victorian life, I want to know more about how Victorian children lived. So to do that, I'm walking back in time at Canterbury Museum with historian Lyndon Fraser, down a Christchurch street as it would have been in the late 1800s. But there's one building that doesn't look much different. I noticed, Lyndon, that the top of the spire up here is already missing off Christchurch Cathedral. Has it, has it happened before? It has, Bridget. It happened in 1888, and it happened on one other occasion. So the earthquakes are not something entirely new here. We've lived with them a long time, even if we'd forgotten Oh, about how powerful they could be. The shops are recreations of Christchurch stores of the Victorian era. And as a museum exhibit, it works beautifully because the buildings can be touched, the windows can be looked through, it even smells old. This street really does stimulate your imagination. It has for generations of kids, mm. and that tactile, hands-on aspect is just so important. That's what I'm hoping we can achieve in our exhibit. As long as it's hands-on and kids can discover things, yeah. especially the, the young ones. Lyndon has been working with Underground Overground's archaeologists to create a social context around the objects they've discovered. One special focus has been the lives of Victorian children. It's a really interesting time to be a kid. Mm. For a start, you look at the old photographs of, of a lot of the children and they're running around in bare feet. They certainly haven't got an obesity problem. They're sufficiently fed. Yep. They're reasonably educated, but not much. And they're certainly not overworked. So it's a great time to be a kid in the sense that you have a lot of freedom. Yep. You can race about. And kids at that time were pretty well armed and dangerous, a danger to themselves and others. <laughs> so they played the, the weapon of choice for kids were, were Shanghai's at that stage. Yeah. They were adept at playing with rifles, at doing all sorts of cruel things to animals, doing birds nesting, eeling. They are really, really active kids. In terms of the toys those children played with, the excavations have thrown up some lovely finds. A toy horse, a ball with the carving of the world on it, and the remains of dolls. So they're fragments of what you'd see in a toy shop like this, but they give us an idea of what children would have been playing with and what they would have been using. Back then, children didn't have many toys like today. A doll was expensive and usually treasured for a long time by its young owner. I say usually treasured because American archaeologists have put a new interpretation on the damaged state that many dolls are found in. Many of the dolls that they were pulling up from their excavations were broken, they, they were stabbed, they had legs that had been pulled off deliberately or they were buried mm. deliberately in the garden. So what they have thought is that maybe these girls are actually resisting, really, um, that kind of feminine socialisation that goes with dolls. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. So these are girls going, I don't want to play with dolls. I want to be out there with a bow and arrow. Absolutely. Oh, I'm really feeling for those girls. I think I would have been one of them. <laughs> <laughs> How about this fantastic dolls house here? I notice everything's not quite straight. That's right, and that's because it's been left in this state because everything fell over during the earthquakes here in Christchurch in 2010 mm. and 2011. It's a nice little remembrance of a point in Christchurch modern history. It is. So I like the nice touch of leaving it in this way as opposed to straightening it all up again. 
my next destination is a building that wouldn't have been out of place on that Victorian street. Hi, Anna. <laughs> Hello. Now, before you go on, you have to wear this. It may not look like much, but this wooden frame building is one of Christchurch's most loved. Shan's Emporium, built in 1865. So we'll be able to go up into the building. Yes, you can. Now, just mind your head as we get over here. We've come up to the first floor. There are four rooms in the building, two up, two down, mm -hmm. and they were for solicitors. They were the first legal firm to set up in Christchurch. However, its true significance is that it's the oldest commercial timber building left in the city. Being timber, it came through the quakes relatively unscathed, unlike most of the buildings around it. But when the decision was made to completely redevelop the block it was on, its future looked grim. So we went to the owner and said, we would like to keep this building in the central city. He said, I will sell it to you for a dollar. I said, sold. Fantastic. But the whole building had to be moved off site. Gosh, that must have been a huge task it to get was, moved it there. Was, it was huge. It was a huge task. The move started at four in the morning. While its journey was less than half a kilometre, a massive crane was needed to lift the building over tram wires that blocked its route. I was very nervous <laughs> and I heaved a sigh of relief when she was put back down on the back of the truck. Shans will be put on new foundations on this site next to Old Trinity Church, which is also undergoing earthquake strengthening and a massive restoration. Shans will be restored to its original condition and turned into a gallery and exhibition space. Unfortunately, many beautiful old buildings have not been so lucky. There was a scorched earth policy with getting rid of what they deemed dangerous buildings. And heritage buildings were deemed dangerous along with everything else. I guess that's the thing, isn't it, about heritage? It's very easy for it to be put aside and, and just left in the too hard basket, isn't it? They could have been mothballed, made safe, until people took the time to really decide on how significant it was and how it could be repaired. And the attitude that really bugs me is, well, it's not really that old. You go to Europe and they're hundreds and thousands of years old. If we had kept having that attitude, we'd never have anything in the future that's hundreds of years old. So that's why it's important to keep our heritage. Heritage Rescue is at the Commons in Christchurch, creating a pop-up museum. I like it. The painting is coming along nicely, and Toby's made progress on the long drop display. This will get cut out, and the artefacts will be at this level here, so that kids can come with torches and actually sort of peer in and see what you find down a long drop. It's not somewhere I would normally go, but it's going to be fun. While I'm at the container, I'm catching up with Justine to see how she's getting on investigating the two books I gave her. So tell me, Justine, what you found out about these lovely little books that came out of a demolished building? Well, the 19th century music book, we've managed to find a jazz singer who's going to be able to um, put into words the social history of the book and how it would have been used at the time and fit it into people's lives. Great. And how about the other one? Well, the temperance book is a really interesting one because we've discovered that the temperance movement was strongly linked to the suffrage movement in Christchurch, obviously, and that, you know, a really prominent figure in that was Kate Shepard. And so I've found someone who's going to be able to tell you more about that link and you're going to be meeting her in Kate Kate Shepherd House, where she lived. Wonderful. But before we hear about the link between the temperance movement and the suffragettes, archaeologist Jesse is going to set the scene for what Christchurch was like in the late 1800s. We keep finding huge, huge rubbish pits filled with thousands of bottles. A popular establishment known as the Standard Hotel stood on this site. The advertisements for the hotel have a long list of of alcohol available and most of what we've read about it suggests that they pretty much just drank and watched the shows. And what would you have seen if you bought tickets to this place? Well, uh, some fairly, um, how do I say, lowbrow entertainment quite possibly, yeah. Um, he actually got his licence revoked at one point for having such objectionable entertainment and customers out on the street. A common form of entertainment was tableau vivant, 
where stationary actors depicted famous scenes from history. However, the standard hotel also offered a raunchier version called Poses Plastique. The living statues would not be wearing very much clothing. Oh. It doesn't sound very respectable for the Victorians or even legal, mm. but it was fine as long as they didn't move. So how would they stand? In, in, in a pose, I suppose, if you were, what, a Greek god or something, <laughs> occasionally they'd wear like nude body stockings oh. to, pr to preserve their modesty. It's like a static lap dancing club, isn't Pretty it? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> From drunken revelling to prohibition and women gaining the vote, much of the impetus for that massive social change happened right here in Christchurch. I'm at Kate Shepherd House, hoping historian Joanna Cobley can shed some light on the temperance movement and the book discovered in the wall cavity of a demolished property. From this very house, mm. Kate Shepherd and her well-connected friends were gathering together and they formed one of the first branches of the women's Christian temperance movement in New Zealand. It was the 1880s and 90s. Women had little or no say in the political and legal goings on of the day. Inspired by British and American feminists, Kate Shepherd and her fellow suffragettes campaigned for prohibition of alcohol, women getting the vote, and a number of other issues. There was policy for social housing, economic reform, sexual education and clothing reform as well and they wanted to liberate women from, from the confinements of the corsets which mm. were doing terrible damage to the internal organs. Absolutely. There must have been something going on in Christchurch and also Kate Shepherd, uh, you know, why she became so involved with it. She did see uh, Christchurch as a land of opportunity for ideals and there were men and women at that time who had really, um, I guess, radical ideas of the day and they believed in trying to create a better place. I love the fact that this book was secreted away inside a wall cavity. Is there a reason, do you think, why a book like this would have been hidden by a woman? It's a curious thing. Um, it's because I can only think from today, you know, and I'm sort of thinking, why would you want to secrete that away? But, you know, one woman having political ideas, you know, is quite strong, and, and temperance, probably not everyone was for it. They certainly had their opponents, as seen in many cartoons and pamphlets of the day. A Dunedin politician, Henry Smith Fish, hired canvases to circulate anti-suffrage petitions. And not surprisingly, the liquor industry was totally opposed. To no avail, in September 1893, Parliament passed a bill giving women the vote, the first nation in the world to do so. At the container, Maria's using simple visual devices to suggest above and below ground levels. Justine is creating a map showing where some of the key artefacts were found. And in a city where aftershocks have been the norm for the last four and a half years, it pays to take precautions. We're just putting some quake wax on the artefacts so that they don't fall off the shelves when we put them down. So far, I've focused on the archaeology discovered in the central city but many of the outlying residential areas and towns were hit just as badly, if not worse. It was all quarter-acre sections with houses built many years ago. I'm in Eastern Christchurch, where whole streets have been red-zoned, meaning the land is no longer fit for habitation. The lack of people, the vacant sections where houses once stood, well, it's an eerie feel. Jenny Bull and her family lived in the street grew up in this street. So the driveway came up this side of the property? Up there, yes. This over here is a very big old walnut tree that we used to collect the nuts from. Yeah. The house and extensive gardens had been in her family since the 1880s. She was in the house when the big quake struck in February 2011. I've never seen anything like these big trees were going like this, because the ground was moving. When the house was demolished, the archaeologists on site made an interesting discovery. The kitchen was a big kitchen about here, and this was under the kitchen floor. The end has been broken yep. to get this message out. What does this say? This bottle was put here by the Honourable J Finn 
on the 20th day of October, 1887, in the year of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Witnessed by David Bandits, or some name I'm not familiar with. It wasn't unusual in Victorian times to incorporate time capsules or messages into the foundations of a building. This bottle comes from a brewing company still operating in Burton-on-Trent in England. I really like the fact, you know, you've got this typical type of bottle for the, for the late 1800s. It's got yes. those bubbles also in the glass, and this is very typical as well, these is dimples it? in the bottom. Oh. And the older they are, often the deeper they are. Right. And they're basically used for stability, so they could stack one on top of the other. The house may have gone, but there are some vestiges of the old property that remain. And look, there's another one here. These are some little eucomus bulbs. We rescued everything that would be bigger than my thumbnail. But look, these have grown to this. Since the house was demolished, Jenny has dug up numerous plants and transplanted them to her new home. Why is it so important to you that you've collected um, these? Well, it's a connection with the home that we've lost in the earthquakes. In a way, I haven't lost everything. Further out of the city lies the old port of Littleton, the gateway for goods and immigrants coming to Christchurch in colonial times. It was badly hit by the quakes, and many of its old buildings have been demolished. I'm meeting archaeologist Luke Tremlett on a building site where excavations have only recently been completed. So out here we've got the most recent layer where the current slope is. You can see that that's been the old slope edge in an earlier point in time. This stratigraphic profile reveals the story of 150 years of land reclamation and perhaps the types of activities that were happening here in the past. I love all these layers and what really comes really evident is all the building materials. Hopefully the different building materials can tell us when the layers were deposited. What do these bricks say to you as the archaeologist? Well, this one here looks to me like a, a fire brick. It's a refractory brick with a higher kaolin ratio that's more heat resistant than other bricks. <laughs> OK, what does that mean in, in normal speak? It's more heat resistant, basically, does that as mean, opposed to your red brick. Does that mean it's earlier, towards the mid-1800s, or are you talking about we're going into the 20th century? I'd say probably going into the 20th century. Glass bottles are often a good indicator of time period. Oh, did, did you see this one here? It's a nice top for us there. It's a nice top. What do you reckon? It's no seams. It's been hand applied, hasn't it? It looks to be, yeah. A bit of a neat job done, though. A neat job, yes. I'd be comfortable with that being back in the 1800s. Yeah, I'd say so. Mm. Do you know what was on this, this site back in the 1800s? What kind of building? Um, between about 1860s and 1920s, there was four aerated water ginger beer bottling companies on site. It's the works. Oh, well, we've definitely got like this. Do you think they might have had horses? Looks to be so. <laughs> it's definitely a horseshoe, isn't it? Clearly, this site has more to give. But Luke and the team had to work within the constraints of the new building project. They just couldn't dig any deeper. The pop-up exhibit in Christchurch is close to completion. Artifacts are placed in the spaces inside the pallet shelving. Beautiful. This is a gas pipe that's come from one of the demolished buildings. It's something a little bit more tactile for the kids to actually touch. And objects are hidden in a digging pit to get kids excited about archaeological discoveries. Excavated objects can tell us a lot about the people who previously lived and worked at a site. But there's one artefact from my time in Christchurch that I still want to know more about. The music book found hidden with a book about temperance in the wall of an old house. To find out more, I've come to Ferrymead, an historic park, to meet musician and historian Janine Bailey, who has examined the book. What's your opinion on it? Well, it's... Right from the start, if you look at it, it's so different. The size of it, it's yeah. teeny. Mm. You know, normally um, a how to sync book these days would probably be a good 
well, at least A4 size, like huge, because, you know, it has to have all the CDs in the back <laughs> <laughs> and DVDs and things as well. Could you actually read the music? Yes, I could, but there were definitely um, differences. Just the, the way that the, the notes are written and the staves are all kind of set out quite differently from these days. I had to keep going, what the heck's that? Oh, is that a rest? Oh, OK. <laughs> The book is aimed at females and clearly assumes the reader has a good knowledge of music theory. Read music, sight, sing, yep. know your stuff. Know your stuff. Well, I guess mm. that was all part of a, a good girl's education, wasn't it? Absolutely. The education part also extends to telling women how they should behave when singing at social gatherings. Normally, like a singer nowadays, you, you know, it's, singers, it's great, you know, you get up and you be proud. Mm. If you read little parts in this book, it's so Jane Austen. It talks about how you should cheerfully agree to sing a song if someone asks you, but then after you've sung one song, you should step back and let other people have a go. Oh, so there's actually yes. an etiquette actually described in Absolutely. the book. Absolutely. So can you do a performance from this book for me so I can hear what it sounds like? Absolutely, I'd love to. But it'll, it'll need to be a duet. <laughs> so I've got a lovely friend of mine, Anna, who I'm sure will be happy to do that with me. Listening to Janine and Anna singing from a book well over a hundred years old, I'm struck by how much a woman's role in Western culture has changed in that time. But I'm also totally mystified. Why did a music book which prescribes a very submissive female role come to be hidden with another book encouraging women not to be victims and speak out against the horrors of alcoholism? They are the most unlikely companions. The pop-up display at the Commons is finished. Fittingly titled Buried Treasures, it features many of the artefacts we've researched. The message in a bottle, fragments of dolls and other toys. The raised pallets in the centre hold more discovered artefacts under perspex that children can examine using magnifying glasses. And the two sand pits contain lots of things for them to discover for themselves. On the back of one of the container doors is an old map of Christchurch showing where some of the most precious artefacts were found. And in the corner, the long drop display, complete with torches to reveal the child's chamber pot and other objects that the archaeologists found down these murky cesspits. Artefacts are labelled with a QR code, which can be scanned with a digital device that will then open to a website where there's more information about the archaeological story. What I want to say is thank you so much to the Heritage Rescue team for this fantastic colourful container which tells these amazing stories about what we've been finding here in Christchurch and telling these stories to children so they can learn more about Christchurch's past and that archaeology and heritage isn't just all about pyramids or Stonehenge, that it's actually about our past and our stories are just as important because they belong to us. So thank you to you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Right, everyone, come on in. As we hoped, the children are going for the hands-on parts of the exhibit. Oh, yuck. They didn't have flushing toilets 100 years ago. No, it was just a big pit in the ground. This is what the archaeologists often find toothbrushes. And also, they're often used for cleaning the artefacts. That's it, you can clean it. Good one. What do you think the best bit is in it? Finding all the stuff in there. Finding the stuff in the sand. <laughs> Where did these come from? People would drop all these stuff off. Well, about eight in the 1850s they started. It's about 176 years ago. Jeez, that, that's a long time ago. It is a long time ago, isn't it? In true pop-up style, the exhibit will only have a short lifespan of eight weeks. Opening on the weekends and manned by local students from Canterbury University and staff from Underground Overground. I think this is the sock. It's a shirt. Oh. You can't help but notice the demolition and rebuild that's going on across Christchurch City since the quakes. But the archaeology has been going on largely unnoticed. 
And I hope that this display recognises that hard work. And what I also hope is that the children of Christchurch get an insight into the rich history of their city. Because, well, after all, they will be the ones making history in the future.